This is it. So this, you, is this is this is the last this is the series finale of the slowdown. Can you believe it? Two years we've been doing this thing. Time flies when you're talking about slow cinema. Yeah. So uh, as much as I hate to bid you farewell, this is the last we will ever be talking about independent cinema or slow <laughs> cinema. It's just the sun has set on this. No, I'm kidding. Probably uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are. We have decided to end the slowdown after two seasons, but that mm -hmm. does not mean we're going to start stop talking about movies every month. Uh, we are going to be rebranding and relaunching with a whole new thing uh, starting in September tentatively called Indie Scene. Yeah. Uh, I say tentatively because I want to make sure there's not another <laughs> mm -hmm. podcast or podcaster out there with that handle, but we'll be back uh, with something. The reason is we want to break out of just kind of talking about slow cinema in particular uh, and get more into independent filmmaking um, and cover a, a broader spectrum. We've kind of had some of that seeping into the edges of the slowdown, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. And that's certainly not to say we've exhausted all of slow cinema, but uh, yeah, I I think this is going to be a fun new venture, and I'm excited to close out the slowdown with this particular movie, The Tree of Life, and mm -hmm. we'll get to the why that's so significant in a few minutes. But first, I want to talk about your upcoming slow cinema opus, <laughs> the Secret Society for Slow Romance. Where are you at with this, brother? Um, good uh, about the new show. Yeah, it should be fun. I mean, we've talked about all kinds of art house, slow movies. So in the new show, we can uh, branch out and also bring in some Hollywood stuff. Because in the two years that we've been doing the show, slow cinema has gone kind of mainstream. The, the uh, Green Knight, the new movie by David Lorry, have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, that's supposed to be a slow cinema type movie. And, uh, you know, that's relatively mainstream. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the new uh, show will be exciting. So yeah. on Slow Romance, uh, yeah, at a very good point, um, all the pictures cut. We got the wide shots. We got the close-ups. Uh, we got all the New York City shots. I had to go through about 20 hours of footage to uh, pick all that out. It was uh, not easy. The, the toughest editing job of my life so far. And... Uh, now I'm working on color grading, which takes forever. Every shot has to be gone over. Uh, there are some filters that kind of bring things to a certain level, then you have to fine tune. And uh, then uh, sound and music. So hopefully within a couple of days, it will be done. It's taken forever, but this is the final version. Very happy with it. It's at around one hour and 40 minutes. And I okay. already submitted a, a sub cut, uh, I mean, a, a, a rough cut to a film festival, Bushwick Film Festival, because of a deadline that had to be met. Um, but yeah, they're fine with me uploading the final version in a couple of days. Your first submission, this is awesome. That's right. So let me ask, because I thought the one of the times we've talked about this, you were looking at a, like a two hour cut of the mm -hmm. film, and now you're at 140. So you cut a, a pretty good chunk out of that. Is mm -hmm. that just little tweaks here and there adding up to about 20 minutes? Or was there like a main component that you're like, this just isn't working? I took a lot of uh, the city shots towards the end of the movie out because uh, in the early part of the, well, for the entire movie to work for the, hold on. Oh yeah, hold on. Okay. <laughs> I have an alarm going off. Like, what is that? All right, good. <laughs> so for the entire movie to work, for the final part of it to work, you have to get into the lives of the characters and slowly build up to the end. Otherwise, it's super absurd and makes no sense. So uh, towards the end of the movie, I wanted less New York City shots and have those scenes move a little bit faster because in the beginning and the middle of the movie, we establish everything that needs to be established so we can move a little bit faster towards the end. So I took out a lot of New York City shots. I had like maybe two hours worth of just New York City shots. That's, you know, a separate timeline. One day when we meet up, I'll show that to you. You might dig it. Uh, and then I had about 80 minutes of, uh, you know, just the two characters talking in the final stuff. So I combined the two into about an hour and 40 minutes. Works really well now. I think uh, some people might go, you know, too much dialogue. Some people might go too many city shots or not enough city shots, but uh, I think it'll work. Let's see. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see it and hopefully I'll be watching it soon. Soon. Um, and 
you know, I should mention that depending on when, you know, I get to see it and we get to talk about it, there might be like maybe a, I don't know if that'll be the first show of indie scene or if that'll be like the postscript post to <laughs> the slowdown, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll tear you over. Yeah. Um, cool. So, yeah, The Tree of Life. Uh, mm -hmm. You watched it again? I watched it sort of for the first time. Oh, good. Uh, um, because I saw it in the theater 10 mm -hmm. years ago. It's, oh, it's... I, wish, I wish I had seen it at a movie theater. I, you know, watching it again this, you know, this week because I had to chop it up because I watched the extended cut, the, the mm -hmm. full three hour cut. And because of my schedule, I had to chop it up into like, like three different viewings, although it was really like 40 minutes, 20 minutes, and then two mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I finished I, it this uh, afternoon. I watched the two minutes and 18, uh, no, two hours and 18 minutes cut. Mm. Okay. I haven't seen the three hour cut, but. I'm sure it'll come back to theaters ever so often. So I'll, I'll catch it in a movie theater. I, you know, I hope so. And I will catch it in a theater, which is, you know, I was just going back and reading my review of the tree of life from 2011. Uh, and it's a, a completely different person writing about that movie mm -hmm. than it is talking about it here tonight. Um, the I, grand visuals will be very nice in a the movie theater. Plus you're, plus you're stuck in there. I can't in the middle of the movie go, let me go get a sandwich. <laughs> well, you could, um, I could but, but I won't. No, but here, like the the thing is, you know, I would not have been able to watch this movie again and appreciate it because mm -hmm. I, I think it was one of the few films that I vowed never to watch again um, because I didn't get it. I was bored to tears. I didn't think any of it made sense. But thanks to my education in slow cinema, which started a couple of years ago, we met for, you know, Werewolf Ninja Philosopher uh, and all the films we've talked about since. I feel like this is my my term paper, my nice. my my graduation thesis. Uh, can I watch The Tree of Life? That was like the big the Moby Dick of my mm -hmm. slow cinema journey. Can I watch this movie again and appreciate it or even understand it? now that I've had some immersion in what Malik, Terrence Malick was doing and mm -hmm. filmmakers of his ilk. And the answer is definitely a resounding yes. Awesome. Now, I've had some conversations about this film, you know, in the last, within the last couple of years. And even though I hadn't revisited it, I kept saying, I think there might be something that I could watch and understand now. And there's still mm -hmm. arguments with people like, no, this movie's boring and pretentious and you know Malik is so far up his own butt that it's not even really a movie I can say having freshly watched it uh, they are incorrect but I don't want to get down on people because much like myself mm -hmm. there is a journey that you can go on to understand films like this which opens up an entirely different can of worms one that I'm kind of struggling with which is I don't feel that you necessarily, unless you're talking about a sequel, like a Marvel movie, mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to watch like 13 other movies in order to understand a movie. Mm -hmm. I still well, I still kind of believe that, but it all depends. It depends on the context. Um, well, I mean, it's like anything, right? It's the more complex things require, like, you know, when we're kids, we don't have a large vocabulary, right? We can't mm -hmm. read. It's like people reading children's books versus reading, uh, you know, um, you know, like uh, Steinbeck or some complex literature. I've used that exact same, be... I've used that exact same argument when talking about slow cinema in the last couple of years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if, if a nine-year-old kid were to be forced to read Dune, for example, and they're bored to tears, and then when they're 18, when they know more about the universe and uh, the world and politics, and mythology and they get to read it again they might be totally into it it's yeah. just an you know certain complex things require even if it's simple looking uh, art uh requires uh knowing certain things in order to appreciate it so yeah i think i think it's fine to need to have seen certain things to make sense of something uh, versus Versus like a baseball game, right? Yeah, baseball game, anyone can understand. But if you don't know the rules of baseball or the history of baseball, or you know, you've never played baseball, it would be like, what are these people doing? It does, the reason I think there's still a gray area for me in terms of movies in particular is if someone recommends that I watch a film, like a Malik mm -hmm. movie, Mm -hmm. And they don't say start with Badlands because that was that was the that was the movie that uh, you know I had seen I think 
two or I'd seen three Malik movies before I watched Badlands. I saw Tree mm-hmm. of Life, I saw Song to Song and Night of Cups. Oh, those are the those are the tough ones. The more right, the, impressionistic the, ones. Right. And I watched them, and because Malik had such a reputation, I figured, oh, well, this is the legendary Terrence Malik. People love him. Mm-hmm. So I watched these movies and I'm like, I don't get any of this. And I think it's kind of terrible. Um, you know, if someone had just tapped me on the shoulder and said, no, before you watch Tree of Life, watch Badlands, because mm-hmm. you'll understand that this guy is capable. He swims in beautiful imagery and, and kind of complex performances. And then when you get into the more impressionistic stuff, you kind of get the sense that, yeah, it's a craftsman kind of going out there on the edge. Whereas it's easy to say, if you watch a film that has these kind of spiritual predecessors that just kind of comes off as pretentious. It's, you know, you walk out of that experience saying, I don't know if this is, you know, just highfalutin bad Mm -hmm. art, or if it is connected to something that came before it that I need to understand. It's sort of a turnoff to people who would want to get into the genre in the first place. If I want to, if I said to someone, before you watch Tree of Life, watch these five other films, they're going to say, wait, before I watch a three hour movie, you want me to spend 15 hours watching other movies? No, thanks. I'll just mm-hmm. go watch Transformers 7. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, or it's like someone who has never heard of Italy, doesn't know Italy exists, doesn't know anything about it. And one day we, we fly them over to Italy and we drop them. They're like, what's with this weird pretentious country? What's with this weird language? Why aren't they speaking English? What's with their what's with their ambitions? Why don't they want to go make a lot of money on Wall Street? It's just a different cultural thing. It yeah, and that, that's why there's still you know a minor discussion happening in my brain as far as you know how accessible does a movie have to be or mm-hmm. how inaccessible can it be before you encourage people to check it out. It depends um, on the person, I think, and what they're that is part of it. Yeah. What they're ready to see, you know. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I did watch the three hour cut of this. And awesome. even though it did feel it felt long in places, I think part of that was because I wasn't strapped down in theater to fully be immersed in it. Because mm-hmm. since it was a decade since I'd seen the theatrical cut, I can't really tell you what the differences are, mm-hmm. except I feel like there was a lot more of the, just the imagery sequences, like the creation awesome. of the planet and uh, nice. the kind of cataclysms at the end, you know, And it was honestly, after I watched the film this afternoon, I listened to not so much watched because I was doing a million other things, but I listened to uh, Matt Zoller Seitz's wonderful two part video essay on the tree of life. We invited Matt on tonight to talk about the uh, talk about his contribution, but he's busy finishing a book. So he wasn't able to make it. But I will stand here and say the uh, I need to watch that. Yes, the Criterion version of this, and you can probably find it online. Uh, okay. The Criterion version of the disc has this two-part essay, and he opens it up by saying it's possibly the least accessible of Malick's work and the most controversial, but it is one of those films that you bring yourself into it and you walk away with your own interpretations. But the interpretation Matt lays out is, I think, kind of the perfect way to look at the film, which mm-hmm. is that this is Sean Penn's character, you know, living in you know, 2001, you know, wherever he is, uh, looking back on his life and seeing uh, just kind of like in an afternoon of him being at his job, thinking about his entire life and fantasizing about the creation of existence, like one of these big existential dread kind of moments where he's mm-hmm. thinking about everything. And the entire film is his memory, not necessarily that we are seeing the truth of what happened, but we're seeing his interpretation of events. Whether or not that's correct, and Malik has not, I don't think, talked about this. He, one of those directors that I understand leaves the work out there to be, ex, you know, interpreted by the audience, not necessarily by him. Uh, I think it's except, a beautiful way to look at it. Uh, yeah, except in his real life, I think his brother committed suicide at a younger age, and I think a lot of writers and commentators have said this movie is about that. Sure, but even that is, you know, that's not him coming out and saying I made sure. this as an homage to my brother. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because of the other two films that I watched, um, Night of Cups and Song to Song, I haven't watched Song to Song again. But I, I haven't did... seen either of those yet. Well, I watched Night of Cups for uh, my fr- our friend Mark Krawcheck's Spoiler Room show, mm-hmm. I think earlier this year or late last year. Um, and again, that was kind of the thing that primed me for watching Tree of Life again. I got that movie in a way that I didn't understand at all before. I oh think, yeah, I remember you talking about it recently. 
it's strange because I feel like that was like Tree of Life was almost a sketch for some of the themes he was talking about in Knight of Cups. Tree of Life is primarily about this childhood kind of memories and reminiscences of a dysfunctional family. Knight of Cups is all present day with a dysfunctional family and kind of a lost Christian Bale standing in for Sean Penn, wandering around a city, wondering what he's done with his life. And there's talk about what happened in their childhood, but there are no flashbacks. So you can almost watch them as companion pieces. Nice. I, don't, I don't know which one I like better, honestly. That sounds weird. Well, I might have to talk about Night of Cups sometime. Yeah, but, maybe we'll watch it on the next show. Yeah, so I want to ask you, because I've been talking forever, what do you think, mm -hmm. what did you make of Tree of Life and how have you never seen Tree of Life before today or this weekend? There's lots weekend? and lots, there's thousands of movies I haven't seen that I should see. Uh, so uh, for my own education as a filmmaker and a film viewer, it was uh, good to see Tree of Life. But mostly I thought about uh, the history of religions, history of Christianity, and uh, why certain gods become, become popular at certain points of time. Now, recently I looked back at how long people have been living in cities. So mm -hmm. it's, it's documented, well-documented, at least for 9,000 years, uh, since 7,000 BC. Jericho is the first city that they mentioned in 7,000 BC. Obviously, you don't just get to cities. There's thousands of years of development for that, right? So for you know, for, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years, we've been close to living in cities, then we live in cities, and cities uh, result in needing complex control structures because the king and his army can't be in everywhere, so we need, also, cities, you know, people interact and social norms come into being, religions, gods, temples, you know, gets tied into uh, the state. But uh, there has to be a sort of a combination of the state that has to support the religion in order for it to grow and be alive. But the people also have to embrace it to some degree. Sure. Um, otherwise, it's the state trying to force it on people, people resisting, or the people trying to force it on the state and the state resisting, which we have many examples of in, in history. So it's interesting that over the, in the last 2000 years uh, through political and other means, Christianity came into being and with, lot, with a lot older religions, you know, there being a lot older religions also happening at the same time, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Chinese religions, Egyptian religion, and other Middle, you know, Mediterranean, Roman, ancient Roman religions, Greek religions. Uh, happening at the same time, you know, roughly at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the focus on the individual in Christianity, the individual being able to connect with the ultimate creator, uh, that's interesting. I think this time period, let's say the common era since the popularity of Christianity, probably requires such a religion uh, for us to function. I mean, you know, the secular life that's non-religious in America is sort of built on Christianity. Same thing in Europe, right? So I think this time period where, where democracy and individual rights are popular kind of requires that kind of a God and that kind of a religion. What do you think? I don't know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you know, I am not as schooled on world religions or religious history, you know, I grew up, uh, was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was an altar boy, that whole shebang. Um, oh, but, but let me clarify saying, uh, so I saw this movie, at the fictional, the story in the movie as a family, uh, dealing with the family crisis, the death of one of the family members, using the framework of their religion. I mean, this is, this I call a, sort of a Christian art house movie, right? It's uh, the answers that you find in the movie are limited by the filmmaker's Christian worldview. And, uh, you know, basically he wants to talk about how Christian ideas and this story come together, how it relates to the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera, which is fine. Every filmmaker comes from some background, whether they're, uh, you know, 
uh, whether it's visible that they're they're talking to through talking from a certain religious standpoint or not, everyone comes from some background. So um, to me, this movie is a family looking for answers within the Christian worldview and within the Christian framework. Why does death and suffering happen uh, in a world created by uh, supposedly supposedly a loving God, et cetera, et cetera? That's why that's what took me into thinking about history of religions and history of Christianity uh, while watching the movie. You know, I, I might have to disagree with you there. Um, mm -hmm. The religious aspect is, I think, a background element. Um, you know, the family, you know, Sean Penn's character is named Jack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see him as an older man looking back on his life in the 1960s. Uh, I don't even know if his parents had names. They were just kind of like, you know, I just thought of them as Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain That's or, right. you know, dad and mom. Yeah, they, they didn't do, say the names. Right. They do. Uh, you do see them a couple of times going to church or in church, um, but they're not, you know, reciting biblical verses. Uh, the well, the way... movie starts with a quote from uh, from the Bible. Right. But I mean, that doesn't but the film, the characters in the film itself are not going around quoting scripture. There's no indication that religion has any more uh, hold on their lives or their attitudes. It's not like they're, uh, you know, fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of that whole thing. You go to church on Sunday, that's what you do. And then you go about your regular life. Mm -hmm. Brad Pitt in his, you know, playing the dad, he and Jessica Chastain are both having their sort of spiritual crises, but they're not turning to scripture or their Christian faith that we see in the film for answers. Um, Brad Pitt seems to be very much stuck in a secular, let's call it, you know, American way mode of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, trying to climb, trying to, you know, make something of himself, trying to build a legacy for his family. Uh, and, but he's a very, you know, kind of a jealous, petty, uh, vindictive person in a lot of ways. So you could make a, you know, a film where that is contrasting with the religion that he's proselytizing to his family, but doesn't really show up. Mm -hmm. I mean, Malik, and, and even in the, the creation, you know, of the universe, we do see that, but we start with the Big Bang ostensibly, we get some dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and then at the end of time, we get the earth like <laughs> floating into the sun essentially and being evaporated. Mm -hmm. uh, but even that, if we go, if we accept, you know, Matt's contention that this is all kind of in Sean Penn's head, mm -hmm. then none of that really happened. But we don't get any passages of, you know, Christ or early mm -hmm. man discovering religion and kind of passing that down. I think religion is sort of a spice in this soup, but mm -hmm. it's certainly not the main ingredient. I don't even know if it's the 12th. No, I think it's, uh, I think that's the, I think uh, Malik's uh, Christian view of the, of the universe or questions regarding it. I don't think he's saying, you know, uh, this is exactly, it's not like, uh, it's not a movie that, that's preaching a, a specific point of view, uh, saying that this is how things are, it should be accepted. It's not dogmatic, but it's uh, coming from, I think, the Christian view of the universe and uh, then the family story is built on that. So that's I mean, why, but, they're, but, they're, but either, either way, it doesn't matter whether we agree on that or not. I just see it as a Christian art film, but which is not a bad thing. You know, it's not, other movies are Buddhist art films, other movies are Muslim art films, blah, 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 secular art films. But yeah, it, does, it doesn't matter. Uh, to me, uh, my reaction to the movie is, it's a family processing through grief and they're kind of, have you know the movie makes it limited through the Christian viewpoint? For example, they don't uh, they don't go to secular therapy or they don't go to a Buddhist priest. They don't you know this. Well, but it was also the 1960s. I mean, there was... <laughs> right, right, of course, <laughs> of course. But uh, in the 50s, uh, Buddhism was known in the U.S. And right, uh, but it was not it was not popular in Waco, Texas, sure, in the sure. suburbs. Well. Right? Depends on the family and uh, but and therapy. You, you, therapy, okay. therapy I, was... I don't honestly. I, again, I don't know how many Buddhists were you know living and practicing uh, in uh, uh, still Waco, Texas. Again, I've never been there, but it doesn't strike me as you know the most diverse place on earth. Right, but but if David Lynch, Jim Jarmusch, uh, myself, Malik, if four filmmakers were given the task of tell the story 
all four would do it differently. I'm just saying Malik made some choices and those choices I think come from his uh, preoccupation with a way of looking at the world that comes from Christianity. But we can move on to another aspect of the movie. Well, uh, I want to get back to this yeah. this idea of the film being about processing grief. I, I, I disagree there too. Mm -hmm. One of the earlier shots is uh, the mother character getting some kind of a letter and we don't see what the letter says. We get the idea that it is about, um, I think this is stated, well, you mentioned it earlier that the- uh, Suicide of, or death. Yeah, one of the younger brothers died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's supposed to be the middle brother based on what you know was in Matt's essay because it's not really clear what happened to even the third brother because there's three kids in this family. Mm -hmm. um, the youngest is played by Ty Sheridan, which is crazy because he's like nine years old in here. And now he's like this big superstar appearing in X-Men and Ready Player mm -hmm. One is like an adult. Uh, but- People grow old. Yeah, we do. And you know, film, oh my God. But the, the point is that all happened much later than the main events of the film. The mm -hmm. movie starts off with this sort of flash forward within the flashback. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the younger brother died when all three of them were in their preteen and teen years as we see throughout, you know, well, you saw the two, 218 cut, I saw the three, but let's call it the hour and a half that we spend this with this family. Mm -hmm. They're all kids all the time. So they're not processing the grief. That is an element that comes in later with the Sean Penn character, mm -hmm. but given everything that he's wrestling with from the weird feelings he had about his mother to the combative relationship we had about his father to whatever he ended up doing as a career, which is clearly not satisfying to him, mm -hmm. the brother's death is an element, but it's unclear how much that affects him and how much it affects his family dynamic. Because also we don't know if his parents are still alive when he's, you know, in the present day, we have no mm -hmm. sense of his current family. Yeah, well, I saw it differently. I saw, I see it. Uh, I see it not just as the Sean Penn characters, but also the Jessica Chastain character, and also the Brad Pitt character dealing with the loss of their son slash brother. But that, uh, but, but what I, I guess what I'm asking is, ninety five percent of the time we spend with their characters in the movie happens before this middle son dies. Uh, no, the middle son dies pretty early on the in, in on the movie. Well, no, she gets, it's she gets, it, it creates she gets, a structure for the movie. Well, no, she gets the letter that mm -hmm. the son is dead. Pretty early that, on within the first 20 minutes. Within the first five minutes, she gets that letter. But the rest of the film is told in the flashback because that middle son is running around with the family throughout the rest of the film. Yeah, yeah. So we, we find out that there's a tragedy early on. Then we get the meaning, you know, who is this kid? What happened? You know, what was their life like? Well, so, I understand, but your framing yeah. of this as being about the mourning of the death of the son, that doesn't no, no, work. Not just, if... not just mourning, but asking why does death happen? Why is there a death in this created universe, uh, supposedly? So we go back even to the, di the days of the dinosaurs, and we see a dinosaur injured and dying, another dinosaur walking by it. So it establishes the movie is uh, talking about how death is an ever-present thing in the history of this unit, of this universe. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just that's just one aspect. I mean, this is this movie has a million things. Yeah. I think if I were to write a script back in the day before the movie was made, I would say, all right, one of the structural elements will be uh, we will have these characters wonder and think about uh, the death of their son or the or the death of the, their brother. Mm hmm. Um. Well, I, let me ask you about the, because this is something that- I was, mean, I, well, one more thing. This is a, a art movie with a capital A. So this is not a movie where we're going to have agreements among viewers about, you know, exactly what is happening and why should it happen that way. It's not like the plot of a, you know, a heist movie, right? Where the X, Y, Z has to happen a certain way. So well, but, but it's time to have differences on, on this. Well, but, Yes, I mean, there are differences in themes and everything. I'm just talking about structurally. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about a few minutes ago with, you know, before you're getting into the interpretation of death on the big big picture, mm -hmm. you're talking about this family mourning a family member. Mm -hmm. And I was saying that structurally in the film, that is a very small element compared to, you know, 
the the actual the goings on of the film because you can't mourn someone 10 years before they're dead uh no 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 it's it's a very significant element you can show someone dying at the start of a movie then you can show their life yeah i understand that but i'm saying if we're talking about a family mourning the loss of this son Mm -hmm. We don't see the family mourning the loss of the son, except for Jessica Chastain getting that letter and kind of breaking down. Mm-hmm. The rest of the film takes place years before she even got that letter. So, but there's yeah, no- that's to, that's to make sense for us. Why, uh, to give us uh, more to, you know, to give us more meaning to the tragedy. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I, well, because there is an enigma around that middle boy who, again, I don't know if we got a name for him. Um, I will say that he looks remarkably like what I imagine Brad Pitt looked like as a child. Mm-hmm. And the, the kid who plays young Jack looks remarkably what I imagine Sean Penn might've looked like as a young boy. So, mm-hmm. and I don't know who Ty Sheridan was supposed to be. He doesn't look like anybody, but um, no, I, I think there's an enigma around that young boy because the camera likes to focus in on him in random moments. We see, I guess, Jack kind of like looking out and seeing his brother on the porch strumming the piano, or not the piano, the guitar, or they had these this kind of game they would play where Jack would put his younger brother in dangerous situations, like holding up a lamp and having him stick a wire in the end of it to see if he got shocked. Later on, <laughs> he sticks his finger down the hole of a BB shotgun and actually does, you know, kind of injure him. Uh, but in terms of what they meant to each other, there's real ambiguity here. The, the focus of Jack's memories, the brother's almost a peripheral character. He seems to be more processing his feelings about his mother uh, and his father. You know, I'd probably have to watch this movie like two or three more times to see where his younger brother quite fit in, except for the fact that he was around and enduring these same kind of childhood abuses at the same time he wasn't in the same house. Hmm. To me, it seems like a question, a, a movie where humans are asking, why does death exist in the universe? And uh, in a death and tragedy in a universe, if uh, that was supposedly created by a loving creator. Uh, and also showing at the same time, yes, death does exist, but there's all, I mean, the film is visually beautiful from yeah. start to end. Uh, so also showing that there's also a ton of beauty in uh, the universe. So I think in the end, I mean, this is no uh, spoiler because this movie has been out for a long time. In the end, uh, the characters, at least Sean Penn's character, either imagining his mom or I, or we're seeing literally uh, something his mom went through, decides to let go, you know, uh, tries to let go of the, of the death and uh, uh, looks like uh, they're, you know, sort of either fantasizing or actually are. So the, the character walking to the beach towards the end. Yeah, so we see Jack walking. Wait, is this the beach that makes people get old fast? No, no. <laughs> okay. And talk about a movie that was easily forgotten. That thing only came back, came out like two weeks ago or three. That's right. Wow. Um, but so he's walking on this beach and he sees all these other people. And some of them are folks from, you know, that we recognize from uh, his life. So the idea being that, uh, you know, we've just seen the world kind of end. So this could be some kind of a spiritual going back to, you know, the kind of the Christian idea of, you know, the rapture or the day of reckoning, the day of judgment. I'm not sure. We keep getting shots back to the sun, which, you know, could represent God. Mm -hmm. It's, It's kind of ambiguous on top of the fact that after we see this kind of reuniting of the family and friends. And again, I'm not sure if this was longer in the uh, you know extended cut than it was in the theatrical, but he has a lot of different reunions uh, with different people. And then it gets kind of trippy, very much uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, which makes sense because I think it was, was it Douglas Trumbull worked on that film as well as uh, mm-hmm. Malik brought him out of retirement to work on this film. But it, the time starts getting trippy at one point he takes the hand of, uh, or maybe it was Jessica Chastain, uh, takes the hand of this very old person's hand. Very old person. Then it cuts to the hand of a younger version of that that same, you know, Mm -hmm. hand, very Stargate-esque, not Mm -hmm. the movie Stargate, but from 2001. Uh, So it's 
it's unclear what this sequence means. And if it's all in, you know, Jack's head as has been hypothesized, uh, it could be just, I wonder what's going to happen at the end. And will I see my family? And it'd be nice to be reunited with everybody and Mm -hmm. have kind of forgiveness and closure that I can't find in my daily life. But then he kind of snaps awake. He's out on the busy city street. And I think someone kind of like bumps into him and he kind of snaps back into consciousness and he seems almost relieved there's like a slight smile which is the first real emotion we've seen on him except for being glum this entire picture Mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's kind of whatever you make of the movie's messaging or the interpretation of it it does end on kind of a lovely note either he's got his you know a sense that things are going to be okay that his life hasn't been a complete disaster Mm -hmm. or the world exploded but he's been reunited with his family and everybody's happy yeah, I think uh, to think about the movie as this one character's uh, ideas, dreams, memories, and projections into the future, at the end, uh, we could say he just comes to the conclusion, things will be all right, uh, either now or a million years in the future, you know, in some kind of uh, physical, literal, or spiritual time that uh, either there's a faint hope that he'll be, the people will be reunited and, you know, will be peaceful together Uh, or just, uh, you know, whether it literally will happen in in the the future or not, he thinks about that and that makes him feel better. And uh, he decides to embrace, not even embrace, but decides to be okay with the reality that he lives in at the moment. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, telling and touching i think that you know when he meets up with his father again in this you know projection on the beach uh he kind of slaps him on the back and his father kind of puts his arm around they're walking you know side by side on the beach not the kind of reunion you'd expect given all the turmoil that they've had in their life leading up to it and this is something that i hadn't picked up on you know i was barely a new dad when Mm -hmm. this movie came out when i saw it uh, so I didn't really pick up on the fatherhood uh, themes. Of course, I grew up with a dad and our relationship was far from you know great. But mm-hmm. watching it now, it's interesting to see how Malik, what he does with that interpretive lens, because as much as Brad Pitt is a hard ass on his, all of his sons, you know, drive them towards perfection. So they make something of themselves. They don't end up like a middle manager, kind of like he is. And Mm -hmm. then the way he talks about his own father, who was, you know, a welder and also like a door to door insurance salesman who, you know, ended up unsatisfied and unfulfilled, you know, Sean Penn, Jack later in his life has ostensibly, we don't know exactly what he does, but he seems to have a pretty high ranking position mm-hmm. at whatever, you know, maybe it's his own design firm or engineering firm or whatever. We see him kind of rising up these beautiful glass, you know, skyscrapers going to his job and then descending to get down to street level. So he's sort of a prince of his own time. Yeah, he seems he's, to have a good job. Yeah, and it, it, you know, he's kind of made the American dream, but it's also unclear what his family life is like. And if making those, you know, kind of personal sacrifices to get where he is, you know, he might have achieved materially what his dad had always aspired to, but does he have love in his life? Which goes back Mm -hmm. to that initial question posed in the film of nature versus grace. This also brings about an interesting aspect of American life in general. Mm -hmm. This is a relatively safe, wealthy, well-established, materially very successful historically country But there are, you know, a lot of people suffer from depression, being unhappy with life in general, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder if the movie is saying in order to enjoy what you have, all the successes you have, you do have to deal with some disturbing ideas uh, from your memories and in your past in order to be able to embrace the the present. Yeah, I I think very much so. I almost wish there was, you know, more to this. And I think that's why Knight of Cups is almost uh, not an answer to some of these questions, but a continuation of the ideas that Malik plants here, mm-hmm. because Christian Bale in that film is a very su- successful Hollywood screenwriter who's out partying and living. He's living the modern version of the American dream that, say, Brad Pitt was striving for and Sean Penn was, you know, kind of slaving away for you know, in his office. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
what that did to his character's uh, psyche and his family that's more explored in a contemporary sense in that okay in good that i'll film. have to watch it i'll have yeah. to watch night of cups yeah um that that movie was not nearly as well received as tree of life and mm -hmm. i wonder if it's because you know that is you know what i remember of song to song i think was the movie that came after that Malik is continually getting more and more impressionistic and fluid, you know, kind of spacey with his narrative. So mm -hmm. maybe people thought that was drifting a little too far away from what he did in Tree of Life. Well, uh, America and Hollywood has trained people to, and also TV, the industry. Also, maybe people in general just prefer narratives where things make easy sense, you know, dialogue, things spoken out, you know, mostly dialogue movies. That's what seemed to be popular. And people like Don Shanahan, who is angry at, you know, this movie, I think, I think uh, what they're angry at is being shown something in a form that's so unfamiliar and uh, so outside the norm. Uh, yeah, it takes some getting used to. But uh, this movie also reminded me of the, another movie we talked about, Outtakes from the Life of a Happy Man. Yes, yeah. yeah. Because uh, in that he's looking back, just the he, we're just seeing positive reflections, but here we're seeing positive and negative. Yeah, I, and that was that had the benefit of being, you know, kind of a real, uh, like you know, more documentary kind of footage, uh, which is why you know what Malik pulls off here is you know even more incredible because it feels so authentic, not necessarily to you know my lived experience, but to someone's, <laughs> it, you mm -hmm. know. What I loved about the slow cinema aspects of this that I could not have understood before, you know, our relationship certainly was the idea that I can sit and watch, just be bombarded by fantastical images that don't seem to make sense, mm -hmm. but just to appreciate what they are and think about what they meant, you know, later. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is something that I know Don has talked about. And I've also talked about with, you know, Mark Krawcheck, they kind of, you know, when they give Malik shit, they say like, mm -hmm. why am I sitting looking at a puddle for a minute of screen time? Like, that's stupid. I understand that, or at least mm -hmm. I still understand it, but I don't, you know, cotton to it as much anymore. You know, when you're looking at that puddle in the context of Tree of Life, you might be thinking Jack is looking back on a terrible, well, to him, a terrible mm -hmm. childhood, partially mm -hmm. his own doing, partially, you know, his messed up family. But, you know, when he's taking stock of these moments of beauty, he's thinking, yeah, that was an awful summer day when my dad, you know, thrashed me across the dinner table. But I love the way that the light kind of shone through the trees or, you know, there was that puddle on the sidewalk that was really cool looking. And that brought me a moment of peace. These are things that you can interpret mm -hmm. as being kind of these signposts of positivity on top of the fact that it's just beautifully photographed. I could sit yeah, there and yeah. watch, you know, take all the narrative stuff out of this. I could just watch a montage of, was it Manuel Lubezki's cinematography in this film and be completely blown away for, you know, two and a half hours. Yeah, when, uh, when I was editing A Slow Romance, which I'm still doing, the, I put together a cut of all the beautiful shots of New York, like two hours. Some days I would just watch that just to get started. I'm like, wow. You know, yeah. I gotta go. I gotta go through tons of dialogue, but these uh, New York segments are amazing. Yeah, and they they also kind of bring stories out of us. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're capturing just life on a city street, it's the human impulse to wonder, like, what's going on in that apartment building? You mm -hmm. know, why is that person sitting alone drinking in a coffee shop? You know, mm -hmm. what, what is there a story behind the, the letter missing in that neon sign? Did someone shoot it out or, you know, what did the bulb just break? You know, it, it kind of invites the, in addition to the story that we're being told, it invites us to kind of, you know, use our imagination. Now, I do want to say, because you called Don Shanahan out and, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a, a dear, dear friend and colleague. Yeah, he, well, he's a well-known, well-known hater of, uh, <laughs> of the, the, the tree of life. Well, I'm excited now that I've watched it again. He and Will Johnson did an episode of the Cinephile Hissy Fit podcast on Tree of Life a couple months ago. And I didn't listen to it because I didn't want to be spoiled before I watched it again. Now I can go back and, and listen to the rigorous defense and bashing of this movie. Good. Will, Will is a fan? I, I, based on the way Don has talked about the movie, I'm assuming that he was on the con side and Will was on the pro side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's like you can't watch, 
you know, Transformers and expect to see a Scorsese movie, right? So movies are the uh, movies are not the same. There's fifteen thousand different versions of movies. This is well, just one way. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because you brought up the Green Knight earlier, and David mm -hmm. Lowry, you know, he did uh, a, a live action remake of a Disney movie with uh, Pete's mm -hmm. Dragon. And then I think in between, he did a ghost story, right. which is, you know, I really dug that movie, but I think that was even, I think I, I could be wrong on the chronology here. I either saw that right after, right before we started talking about slow cinema, because I really got into that oh, good, good. movie. Um, but yeah. When did, it, when did it come out? A couple I of years ago? Yeah, I can't remember. It was 2018. I don't know if it was yeah, 2017. Um, well, we started this show in August of 2019, uh, okay. exactly two years, because that's how long I've been working on the movie. <sighs> See, again, <laughs> I've got this COVID gap. I'm, I'm always like plus or minusing things a year because of this kind of oh. lost year that we had. Yeah, one thing about, I saw a full cut of my movie uh, with all the shots and all the dialogue in, mm -hmm. in one sitting uh, with no breaks. It was very therapeutic. It took away... Uh, half of my stress from 2020 because it's it's people sitting in a you know space talking about real life it helps you plus beautiful visuals of real life in mm -hmm. new york it really helps you focus back in and sort of dissolve into uh the real world past the covid haze so yeah i think people i think some people really enjoy the movie and it's not people talking, you know, to each other through a screen. There, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like, you know, it's not like a space show. You know, it's not like a superhero show. It's really people hey, you're getting... spoiling the whole thing, man. That's Come on, right. that's right. But <laughs> it's reconnecting with uh, certain positive aspects of real life. I think, I think uh, the movie will be therapeutic in some sense uh, for people in, in helping them recover. Same, you know, same with Amir's Amir's movie, man. Same with a lot of slow cinema movies. It helps you reconnect with the real world. And that's something that, you know, I really do appreciate about the slow cinema that we've we've talked about is everything is very fast paced. Everything is very argumentative and, and you know, partisan, especially in the last you know couple of years. Right. And also in the movies, escapist, you know, superheroes, space shows. Right. But even, you know, the escapism is very, you know, th that we see in Hollywood and, you know, mainstream movies is very kinetic, you know, a thousand mm -hmm. shots, a lot going on. you know, lot, lots of edits, um, the special effects and that kind of thing. It is nice to be able to just sit back and watch someone make a sandwich or, <laughs> right, know, right. or go on an awkward date or, you know, connect with someone uh, or even, you know, as have, with a Tree of, right, have a debate uh, or even going back to Tree of Life which feels, you know, even fresher now than it did, you know, 10 years ago. And that's why I would love to see this on a big screen. I hope there's some kind of a revival to watch the, you know, the extended cut, you know, at mm -hmm. the music box, throw in an intermission or something if you, if you feel folks need it. But it really does feel like an immersive, you know, I'm going to take, you're going to have to sit here, absorb the history of the universe and this messed up family and kind of put your own life into perspective. Did you have a happy childhood? Was it tumultuous? How do you feel about where you're at now? How do you feel about your place in the universe? Mm -hmm. It invites all these big questions. So I think to approach it as a chore, like I'm gonna watch this three hour movie where quote unquote, nothing happens. <laughs> right. That's the wrong way to go into it. That's the wrong way to go. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and also, like I said, it made me think about uh, the function of religion in in uh, in history right and you know people in i think people invent the religions that they need at a given point and place uh, so i wouldn't be surprised at all if we master living for eternal life or whatever if we get rid of all the health issues if we become a trans like a intergalactic civilization uh, new religions may come into being that say, no, living on earth alone is not the, not the will of the creator or uh, dying at a uh, hundred years or a thousand years is not the will of the creator. The universe is vast. It's, it goes on forever. Why shouldn't we live forever? Why shouldn't we branch out you know, all over the universe? Why should we just be tied to one planet? So I think uh, <clears throat> we kind of see it after the fact 
you know, we get born into a society which is the, with the established religion, but that religion came into being for certain purposes, uh, which at the time of his invention may have been necessary. Well, it's interesting, you know, a couple of things. Um, first, I think if we do get off this planet and, you know, in a significant way and start colonizing other planets, you know, I don't know if this is a hundred years or a thousand years in our future where we're truly, you know, uh, kind of colonizing and, you know, inhabiting planets the way that we inhabit Earth mm -hmm. and going out beyond that, uh, that's going to put a wrench in, you know, a lot of the kind of religious conversation that we're having here on Earth, the idea mm -hmm. that mankind has supremacy, that we were given Earth as sort of our dominion, as opposed to thinking of, you know, the galaxy. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm reading the Bible right now i'm reading you know essentially a page a day it's a project i picked up you know a couple of years ago and then kind of like left off and now i've picked it up again mm -hmm. it's a it's a dense kind of tough work especially if you're just looking at it I, I, i'm kind of approaching it like i said i grew up catholic um with a lot of these ideas you know kind of ingrained into me from a young age mm -hmm. but reading the text and trying to understand it as something that was interpreted both metaphorically and kind of interpreted by scholars over the you know thousands of years but also looking at it from the fundamentalist point of view as there are certain you know groups out there that believe the literal truth of the scripture mm -hmm. you look at genesis and you look at people living to be a thousand years old Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as as the books go on and there are more generations of people which they right. also don't explain how these generations of people sprung up from you know just adam and eve mm -hmm. it's like you've got cain and abel and they go into a town and they meet other people like where the hell did they came <laughs> come from oh uh, oh uh, related to that uh in reading back about the history of people living in cities the early Mesopotam mesopotamian religions uh you know 5,000 years before Christianity, uh, had some of the same stories that were picked up by other people down the road. So you might want to, when you're done with the Bible, uh, you know, read up on uh, Mesopot ancient Mesopotamian religions and see where some of the stories came from. Um, I think whether stories are, whether things happen for real or not, uh, it, they may have a significant meaning and value to present day individuals. So oh, sure. I'm I'm starting off at the with the reference point that is most you know familiar to me as far as mm -hmm. trying to understand the stuff that I've been taught over the course of my life. Um, you know, with the idea, you know, I've read like like 15 years ago, I read, you know, read up on Kabbalah and you know different things like that. But uh, as far as being a scholar, I'm far from that. And I am somewhat familiar with the idea that there are stories that are similar to those in Christianity that certainly predate Christianity. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. But like I said, I'm looking at this from the point of view of, you know, if this is supposed to be the story of everything that has happened, then we are meant to believe that at the beginning of time, people lived for thousands mm -hmm. and hundreds of years. So what you're talking about is, can we transcend our current <laughs> mortal right. limitations. Right. It'd be interesting if, in some cockamamie way, all of this was does turn out to be true mm -hmm. once we get out of the simulation and find, <laughs> you know, go on to the next step. Like, oh yeah, you're gonna live for a thousand years because that's how you started out. Something went wrong, and we just didn't include that in the book. Mm -hmm. It's all nuts. But yeah. that's that's why I think Tree of Life is such a an interesting movie because, as dour as it is. And is you know kind of dealing with these big life or death issues, it does end on a surprisingly positive note. And and throughout the movie, it's not dour. You have great music, great visuals, amazing visuals. There's some some negative stuff, uh, hard stuff about family life, but uh, the about the creation and purpose of the universe, Buddhism uh, deals with it in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, Buddhism says, don't worry about that, those questions. They, uh, Buddhism says. Uh, human existence is like a man who's been wounded with an arrow, right? Your job is to pull out the arrow, not to worry about where the arrow came from. Once you pull out the arrow, you can worry about the other stuff. And the pulling out of the arrow takes out lifetimes. So Buddhism says, don't even worry about those questions that, uh, you know, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to understand those. Work on eliminating suffering for yourself by letting go of attachments and then you can get to the other questions. 
Now, as far as letting go of attachments, what does that mean exactly? Well, it says uh, in Buddhism, it says all human suffering comes from excessive attachment to uh, the desire to live, uh, you know, desire, you know, attach, excessive attachment to anything, hmm. including the belief that you are a singular being and, uh, you know, the attachment to life and the fear of death comes from that. So Buddhism says in part, you're not a singular being. You're, uh, you're part of a process. You know, you're, your body is made up of different processes. You come into the being through a you know, great chain of human events, et cetera, et cetera, that thinking you are supposed to be eternal or that you shouldn't die, uh, that kind of deep attachment to uh, things, you know, looking at way, things in an unnatural way, according to that worldview, is what brings about suffering. So, so the, that religion says, the great discovery of the Buddha was figuring out how to let go of attachment to a sufficient degree, not fully, not like not eating and killing yourself, right? <laughs> uh, it teaches the middle way. It says you shouldn't be too attached and you shouldn't let go too much, you know, it, travel the middle path. It's a nice idea, but I guess it get, gets back to the heart of my question about all religions. Mm -hmm is how does anybody know that? Like the idea of kind of like removing this arrow so you can right. kind of figure it out over lifetimes or whatever. Right. Where, where does that idea come from? I, that comes so, from so, history history of uh, Indian religions. Right, the, but I uh, guess, but but my point is, have people come back to say- No, you know, no, no, it's a religion. It's something that you yeah. believe in because it works. But uh, Right, it, and that, that's that's the thing is it's not, it's, it's, it all comes back to an interpretation of sure. the human condition but it's not necessarily based on anything that we can say is fact. It's a lot of it is well, kind of nice to haves. But uh, but but uh, letting go of greed and excessive ambition and accepting that death happens and that's a natural part of life. Those things are useful in dealing with just regular life. Yeah, and those things are actively useful. Yes, I agree. I just, I think that you can also, you can separate that out from the sure. idea of, you know, you're going to be working on this for right, a long right. time, not necessarily in this form. Like that's kind of where you lose me. And also it's you know, frankly where, you know, Christianity and uh, everyone's got these weird quirks. It's right. nice that we get like laws and kind of like the beatitudes, you know, do unto others. The golden right, right. rule is amazing. Yeah. I just don't know that I need the, you know, the, the death and resurrection part of it to, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like selling certain values through the story of Luke Skywalker, right? Eventually, and, and toys, a, and toys. Yeah, eventually, yeah. it might become a grand religion, and people might, might be in ten thousand years. They might be like, "No, Luke Skywalker was real. <laughs> <laughs> we have proof. <laughs> we well, have this audio, video recording, ancient, sacred recording. The, the Last Jedi, and then, yeah. then there was yeah, the but, lost." But, but, there was the lost chapter of the of the rise of Skywalker, which no That's one will right. be talking about in three hundred years. <laughs> no, three thirty thousand years. But the but the point is not whether Luke Skywalker was real or not. The point is if you if you pursue something aggressively, like Darth Vader, to control everything, to uh, you know try to avoid you know a tragedy like his mom's death, you may succumb into a very in a very dark way of doing things. That's not good for anyone. Yeah. I, wow. We've, we've come a long way from talking about the tree of life, but still talking about the spirit of the tree right. of life. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's how mythology and religion tries to impart values. Also how those mythology and religions come from a specific need or a specific point in time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I love this movie now. And awesome. I hate I hated the movie the first time I saw it. Um, I think I'm going to put uh, I was re as I mentioned, I was rereading my review right before we got on. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to put a disclaimer right. at the top Good of idea. that review, along with a link to this show. So people can say this was the work of someone who didn't get it a decade ago. Read it, cry and then listen to the happy ending, much like yeah. Terrence Malick's movie. And then Terrence Malick can be friends with you. Uh, I think that's the only thing that kept him from emailing you and hanging out with you because uh you know you i'm sure that was it yeah that no was it. 
Well, no, I, it was cool because uh, a few months ago, uh, David Fowley and I talked to uh, Julio Quintana about uh, a film that he had come up come out with on Netflix, um, and he actually cut his teeth working on the Tree of Life. Oh yeah, um, I read that. I yeah. saw that video. Yeah, it was, and it's that was uh, again one of those nice little connections because instead of feeling like I had to avoid talking about the Tree of Life or Terrence Malick because I hated it so much, mm -hmm. I felt like. I haven't revisited the film yet, but I, I appreciate it a lot more. And I want to know more about what it was like to work on that movie. So uh, yeah, it's a fun experience or, you know, talking to him anyway. Yeah. Um, well, as it happened with the mystery train, when I, that's the real, that's the first slow cinema type movie I got into. Yeah. If people connect with the work that is where the story is not told in the usual way and is slower uh, then a whole new world of uh, you know movies opens up to them. And I would like to thank you for opening that door uh, All right. for me with, with Werewolf. With Werewolf Ninja Philosopher, yes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we get a we get a one shot of Werewolf in the new movie where the the characters are watching that movie. Excellent. You cannot cut that out. That's right. All right. Um, but yeah, Sajua, thank you again for talking oh, about one more thing that oh. uh, tree of life made 60 million dollars not bad for a weird art house movie is that globally or domestically i think that's mostly domestic uh, it might be global it might be global but okay a lot of that was from the u.s and uh, it was made for 30 million dollars report reportedly so financially it did well if it was yeah it was made for 30 and it, it took in 60, it probably just about broke even once you're done with, well, and you know, I don't know how much the marketing budget was for this. <laughs> well, uh, studios I th I th will say it lost money, but nevertheless, yeah. if these numbers are correct, that's just theatrical, so. Yeah, uh, and I wonder, I wonder how much of that was the draw of like Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain, like this is their new movie, and how much of was actually repeat business, because um, I remember it being you know well, talked about a lot mm -hmm. when it came out. I read, I read about the movie and uh, 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 how Christians feel about it. There is a big Christian fan base to the movie, and uh, many Christian film critics have said very good things about it. So I think the movie worked for a certain demographic, both the Brad Pitt fans and Malik Art House fans, and also Christian, uh, Christian, uh, Christians who like the themes in the movie. Hey, we haven't really talked about the performance as much. Uh, so just before we go, I would like to say that you know, I think this is a hell of a performance from Brad Pitt. And even mm -hmm. I don't have the, the actor who played young Jack uh, right in front of me, but there's this isn't a very dialogue heavy movie. A lot of it is done through, you know, the way that the actors look. It's as if we're catching visuals from scenes that we just caught the, the, the tail end of. We're mm -hmm. catching reactions. We're catching, you know, just subtleties of movements. Uh, you know, Pitt as much as he started off as kind of a pretty boy movie star, you know, 25, 30 years ago, he really has come into his own as a, a nuanced uh, performer. I think that really comes across in this movie. This is unlike a lot of what I've seen him do. Two more things that I'm done. Yeah. Uh, we, should, we should look at Kevin Jorah Everson. He makes very art, arty movies as in no narrative, interesting shots of the moon and stuff like that. And it's made a lot of them. He's a well-regarded art filmmaker. I mean, way in the art column but uh, <laughs> so some of the some of the visuals some of the scenes in this movie reminded me of some of Kevin Jerome Everson's movies also he's one of the few black filmmakers who are in this art house international art house space hmm. so that's that's an interesting thing to look at and he, he and he focuses his camera largely on black life uh also nature etc so that's a possible filmmaker to talk about in the next show and uh, oh, and Terrence Malick comes from a Middle Eastern background. I don't know if his family's always been Christian. So that might be interesting if in the future, if he uh, decides to look at Middle Eastern life, he is making a new movie about Jesus. So I guess that's, it takes place in Jesus's time. So I guess that's a Middle Eastern Christian story <laughs> or the ultimate Middle Eastern Christian story. Wow. Um, it'll be interesting to see that uh, <laughs> I almost want to do a double feature of that and the Passion of the Christ. I imagine there they're going to be two completely separate uh, aesthetics and attitudes. That's, no, that's right. fa fascinating. I didn't know who was. Is he shooting it now, or is he gearing yeah, up to do a, it? Yeah, it's almost done uh, from what I heard. Wow. All right. Well, that'll be something definitely to talk about uh, on the next 
on the next series whenever mm-hmm. it releases. But um, yeah, again, thank you so much for for doing this two year journey of uh, slow cinema, and I look forward fun. to our next adventures. Uh, we're going to be back next month possibly talking about uh slow hopefully no we will be talking about slow romance that's right within the next month and also um, maybe in a couple of weeks maybe in a week we'll see right i think on in september we've got uh isn't our friend chris hansen coming back to talk Mm -hmm. about um his live uh, his movie uh seven short films about our marriage our marriage yeah yes it looks like a good movie yeah so yeah stay tuned for that and um yeah sejua oh and facets is reopening september 17th i think that's for right. live screenings yes uh well <laughs> i know that's the plan but you know <laughs> as i'm seeing on the uh, on twitter the the big meme right now is the side-by-side picture of my fall plans delta that's variants right. <laughs> let's see let's see how it goes i'm wishing nothing but good things for facets and art house right. cinemas everywhere um so we'll we'll t- take it day by day awesome but, uh, so i'll yeah. be in touch later in the week when the movie's done Yes, and uh, we'll be talking about it soon. So again, I'm letting you go for real this time. Thank you so much. And uh, it's been a hell of a ride and can't, can't wait for the next steps. All right. Talk to you later. Take care, man.